Well, I gotta tell you, this has been quite a week. There are those weeks that are just a week, right? And then there are those weeks that are quite a week. Uh, but good, so good, uh, because of God's <coughs> faithfulness. That, that's the word that we just keep coming back to this morning, right? Amen. God's faithfulness. God is ever faithful. I gotta share a, a story with you this week. As we've been praying for our sister Christina, uh, she uh, was taken to Winter Haven Hospital. And when they discovered that she had an aneurysm, they wanted to quickly move her to Lakeland Hospital where they would be able to take care of her medically uh, just a little bit better than they were able to at Winter Haven. And I was on the phone with her when she was at Winter Haven Hospital still. And I said to her, hey, I want to come visit you because, man, this is scary stuff, and I want to be near you, and I want to pray with you. And she said to me, well, here's the thing. Um, they're they're going to be taking me to Lakeland, and so why don't you just, you know, wait until I get there with the ambulance picking me up and everything else like that. And I said, okay, we can, we can definitely do that. And so hung up the phone with Christina, and immediately uh, after hanging up, I heard the Lord saying to me, no, right now is the time to go. You go see her, and you pray with her, and you be with her. And it was kind of a weird place to be because I said, well, Lord, I just told Christina that I'll come to Lakeland Hospital, and I don't want to show up unannounced. That might be weird. It might be strange because she's, she may not be ready for me. And I heard him say again, he said, no, just right now, just go. Hear, I, you hear me and walk with me in this. And in those times where we can look back and say, God, you've always been faithful to lead when I know you're speaking. So, okay, just going to go. So our family drives over to Winter Haven because we were jumping around all day. We visited Teddy and we visited Nan and got to pray with them together and anoint. And it was awesome, just awesome. And we get to Winter Haven Hospital. And I'm thinking to myself, by the time I get into Christina's room, she is probably going to be gone with the ambulance that's picked her up because I got to check in through security and I'm a suspicious looking guy as it is, <laughs> right? And so, but I get uh, into the hospital quite quickly and got to Christina in about 12, 12 minutes time. And I just, I, I remember, and it, it was so awesome, church, it is, if you've been to that Winter Haven Hospital and you slide open those metal doors to step in and to minister, uh, when I stepped into that room, I don't know how to describe it to you other than stepping into this bubble of majesty Amen. where it was like the presence of God was already in that place to meet Christina and I together. Mm -hmm. And I remember looking in like, Christina, I'm so sorry that I'm here because you said to just meet you at Lakeland. And, but she, that, that was not her response at all. She sees my face and I see hers, and there's just incredible relief on her and on me too, you know. And I step into that room, and her and I, we, we prayed together and talked together, and there was just that, that peace that came heavy and mightily upon her and I both. I, I shared with my family after I said, I've rarely experienced the presence of God like in that moment with Christina. And what happened after that is she didn't really even end up going to Lakeland. She ended up getting life flighted because of the aneurysm and wanting to treat her quickly to Tampa Hospital. So it was like when God said, go and visit her now, there was something more in that than even what I knew about because it would have taken a long time to get to her. Why do I share that with you this morning? Well, because of God's faithfulness, because of God's goodness Amen. and that if we would stop and we would hear him you know or if we would hear him and then start just be ready to respond to his voice and knowing that he will speak to us and move oh church Amen. wonderful and beautiful and magnificent and more could we just call them majesty bubbles Amen. could happen in this place they are. as we commune with the Lord and then walk in his way and his will and his direction and ultimately, that is what we have been going after in this series, in lessons from our Lord, to learn to hear him and respond to him, to know him and know him better, 
so that we may, it says, conform, to turn more and more into the image of who Jesus Christ is, who came to do the will of the Father. And one thing that we learned about Jesus is he prayed. He prayed and he prayed and he prayed. So let's do that before we open up our sermon this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word. We say it again. We thank you for your faithfulness. Jesus, you have shown yourself and proven yourself time and again that if we would seek you, you will be and always are Lord of our life. And that is our heart's cry this morning. Lord, we say this time and again that we need you. Lord, we need you because, frankly, we don't have church and everything that it that it's meant to be in filling us with your hope, being filled with the Holy Spirit. God, we need you. We need you in your filling in our lives. So as we move forward now into opening up your word, we pray that you would speak to us. We pray that we would hear you, Lord, and that our spirit would be aligned with your spirit and that you would move us into the place that you desire us to be and that we would walk with you in that, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, lessons from our Lord. This has been our series now for nearly three months. And I'd like to give a short summation because have any of you kind of forgotten what have we talked about in the last three months? Like me, a lot of the time, I wonder, what did I talk about three minutes ago? I don't think I can even really recall that, let alone three months. And we have covered a lot of wonderful topics and lessons from our Lord throughout this series. The first one being that we are called to be a people at work for the Father. Amen? Amen. Jesus was at work constantly for the Father. We, as his children, ought to be too. And as we do that work, we should be willing to get uncomfortable. We don't like to get uncomfortable. I'll go back to it again. We like to sleep in luxury mattresses. Or we love to have jobs where it's like I sample ice cream all day for my work. You know, but being willing to get uncomfortable, to go into the ditches for the Lord, because out of the ditches, the blessings of God will flow if that's where he's asking us to be. We learn from our Lord as well what it means to have that posture of prayer. A praying church is a powerful church, a laboring church, to be a laboring church. We're going to talk more about that today, to be a church which seeks first the kingdom of God, having ears to hear what God is speaking and to respond out of his movement in our lives to act in whatever he's calling us to. We've talked about being vulnerable. We've talked about the rich young ruler who just, he had that trouble of letting go of what was his, which more so possessed him. And then we also talked about the widow and the mites where she said, my only hope, even though I have little, Lord, I give that to you because ultimately my only hope is you. It's been a good series, hasn't it? Yeah. yeah? And I hope in some of that that the Holy Spirit is even bringing recall into your minds, into your hearts of saying, do you remember what was said in that message? And that as you walk forward, the Lord is leading you in his truth because we've heard the truth. But it's our response to the truth that really matters, that puts the wheel on the ground and moves us forward and moves the kingdom of God forward. And we're going to talk about something today, church, about this movement forward in Jesus Christ and the call that he's placed on our lives. So if we have learned anything from our series, let it be this, that to be led by Jesus the way, the truth, and the life is the ultimate pursuit of any Christian. To be led by him. To walk as Jesus walked. To look at his example and walk as he walked. To proclaim as he proclaimed. To see as he sees. To give life as he gives life. 
You know, the, the magnificent and ever-present invitation of Jesus to all is this, and we covered it earlier. Matthew 4.19 says, Jesus said to his disciples, come and follow me. Now, I just want to stop at those words for a moment to consider them. Do you know that come and follow me, that those words you pretty much find right there, the summation of Christianity. What does it mean to be a Christian? It means to be a follower of Jesus. And his invitation then to his disciples is his invitation now to his disciples. Come, get with me, find where I am, and then walk with me. And it's a beautiful thing because we've gotten to learn through this series that it is so good to walk with Jesus, whether good or whether bad, whether beautiful or whether ugly, whether in the valley or on the hilltop. It is good to be where Jesus is because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And in that, the great reward that we have, that we get to do life with the creator of heaven and earth and all the universe and finding our purpose in him in his constant invitation every day, every morning. When you woke up this morning, do you know that Jesus' invitation to you was, come, let's do this thing called life together. Follow me. And let's walk as one. We sang the words earlier. To be happy in Jesus is to trust and obey. There is no other way. And so in asking the question, what might Jesus be calling us to? To trust and obey his people his church, his work for us. And again, I'd like to submit that the same work Jesus called his disciples to then is the call that he still has upon us now. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. A question for you. Are you ready to get to work? Are you ready to be a fisherman? Truly, the harvest is plentiful. There are more fish than could be counted all around us that we have the opportunity to give witness and to be fishers of men as the Lord has called into our life. So the fish are many. It is, if you didn't know already, it is fishing season. And it has been for quite some time now. So let's talk about fishing. Uh, for one, you should know this. Your pastor is a terrible fisherman. I'm horrible at it. I'm hor I've never been instructed. If y'all are hearing me say that this morning and somebody's a good fisherman, you go right ahead and say, let's, let's go out on the waters, Pastor Josh. And I'd be happy to follow you. But I am. I'm a, I am a terrible fisherman, right? So for me, and, and this is actually probably... I have one other fishing pole, but it's not much nicer than this one, okay? Um, I've never been trained and instructed how, how to be a good fisherman. Now, and more to come on that a little bit later. We're gonna, we're gonna pull that, can we call that a fishing pole? Did it look enough like one? No. Like, I think it needs some work. I think it needs some work. And, and isn't it good then, actually, so that, that Jesus said, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Well, Lord, look at, this, this is my rod right now. I don't know how good I'm going to be able to be at being a fisherman for you. I don't know what I could catch with this thing. And I love what Jesus' invitation is in his words. 
that he says, come and follow me, and I will make, I will mold, I will create in you the ability to be fishers of men. The word comes in that active future tense. This is what will happen looking ahead if this is what you will do. If you will come and follow me, I will, my promise, make you fishers of men. I will equip you. I will have you prepared. And we know all about that in the Holy Spirit, whom the Lord has sent down to us in our lives. That, that, that's one piece of it. Okay, so by that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get off track, Lord, if I go too much into that, okay? <laughs> Keep praying. Say, Lord, direct our pastor's thoughts piece by piece. So I'm really glad, again, that the Lord didn't say, follow me, because you are fishers of men. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So to be made a fisher, we must follow him. And the text of scripture, which we are going to read here, connects to that so beautifully. Um, there's all types of different <coughs> story and poetry and uh, the scriptures that are filled with all different forms of writing. And we're going to step into something that's called an allegory, an allegory story. It is a story uh, this is what allegory is, a story or poem or picture that can be interpreted to reveal a hidden meaning. All right, so now you know. If you didn't learn something, something new, that, that's what allegory is. I learned that, so I was like, what, what is this thing we're looking at? So if you would turn with me, open your scriptures up with me to John chapter 21. We are going to read... And we'll start out at verses 1 through 7. After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. So and after these things is after his resurrection, after he's already revealed himself and people have seen him. He manifested himself in this way. There were together Simon, Peter, and Thomas, called Didymus, and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will also come with you. They went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing, nothing. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus therefore said to them, Children, you do not have any fish, do you? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right hand side of the boat, and you will find a catch. They cast, therefore, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. That disciple, therefore, whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, it is the Lord. And so when Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. Peter was stripped for work. He was in the boat. He was fishing. <clears throat> Why? He wanted to catch fish. He wanted to catch fish, right? And I love in the allegory of this story that if we pay attention, because every word of God is written for purpose and reason for us to consider and say, why is this story here? 
and what is it to mean for our lives? This is the word I'm hearing from God, and I did not plan this, but I'm hearing from him first to share this. Peter was stripped, and he had put on his outer garment before going to his Lord. He was stripped. There are times that in order for the Lord to use us for his work and his purposes in our lives, there must first be a stripping. There must be a pulling off of ourselves and of the world and a preparation of knowing the labor that we're going to step into and having ourselves ready to be used by God, stripping ourselves of all of the world and all of ourselves so that we may be used for Him and His will. His will for our lives. Not ours. So Peter was stripped. And he was fishing. And I love in this text what Peter says. Because Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I think what Peter was probably doing in this moment too is I'm, I'm just going to do the thing closest to what I know my Lord already told me to do, which was to fish. So I'm just going to get out on the waters, and I'm just going to be out there and near. And, and so fit the fishing, okay? Let's talk about the fishing, because this is a story of allegory. Has Jesus called us to fish? Yes! yes. Let me ask you again. Has Jesus called us to fish? Yes. If you're a terrible fisherman, has Jesus called you to fish? Yes. If you're a great fisherman, has Jesus called you to fish? Yes. 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 Jesus' call in our lives is to be fishers and fishers of men. And I want you to pay attention here that Simon Peter, right, just note where the fishing began. He said, I'm going fishing. I'm going fishing. How many of you, right, want to raise your hand and looking out, knowing that the harvest is plentiful and that the people are many, that the messengers are few, but the message needs to be heard, that we need to be a people who is about going out fishing to be fishers of men. And if we would do that, I love what the response is of the disciples after Peter said, I'm going fishing. We're coming with you. We want to fish too. We know that there could be a catch hat and a blessing received as we take part in the work. I would love it, church. If I heard this week, somebody you even to come up to your pastor and you said, I'm going fishing. And not just on the waters, but looking around you and seeing that the harvest is plentiful. God has work for us to do. And we must put on Jesus Christ and walk in his way and his will and say, Jesus, I am ready to fish for you. And that as one says it and another hears it, that that one says, that sounds good. Let's go fishing together. Let's hop in the boat and get ourselves ready. Strip ourselves for the work of God and go do the work of God together. So there the disciples are. They're fishing in the boat. But then we're told this rather depressing news in the next verse. That the disciples spent the whole night fishing and they didn't catch a single thing. They didn't catch any fish. I got to ask you, and again, so because we've stepped into an allegory. Are you connecting with the allegory here and the picture of the story? Have any of you ever gone fishing and you felt like, I've been fishing for months, but I haven't caught a fish. I haven't gotten a bite on the bait that I put out. Nothing. Nothing. What's going on here? And I'll tell you, because the most likely time when you think you'd catch a fish is at night time. They call it night fishing. And that's the most suspected time where it's like, this is when we should pick something up. But the disciples caught nothing. And we gotta keep connecting with the allegory to this 
picture story in the scripture for our lives. Because we're turned, well, we're, we're turned. <laughs> oh man, yes, I just said that word. We are told in the scripture that the next thing that happens is that when day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Let me tell you this. We have no hope of catching fish as fishers of men unless we have Jesus connected to that work and being moved by the Holy Spirit. We can put on as much bait or as much love and all of those things and all the answers. There's so many forms of evangelism that, that are possible from apologetics and to just loving thy neighbor and numerous, numerous ways to make the gospel known and to present God to the world. But let me tell you something. If you're busy presenting God to the world without you first presenting yourself to him, you have no hope of catching anything. It is opening your eyes and taking your fish reel, as pathetic as it might be, and saying, Lord, where do I cast? Where do I cast? Where are the fish? And you stop and you listen. Because Jesus spoke to his disciples. Daybreak came. Jesus was now present. Now something significant could happen. All of their fishing that had happened before, it was in vanity. In connecting to the allegory. If Jesus isn't present and you're just busy trying to catch fish, it's right in this context to say, good luck. Because luck is all you're going to have when the Spirit isn't present. But when the power and the presence of the Spirit is present and Jesus is present, who knows only the Lord what could be drawn up and caught. Jesus said, cast the net on the right side of the boat. Now, I would think it would be awesome were if they said, you know, that's a great idea. We've only been casting on the left side all night. <laughs> we did the back. We did the left, we did the front. We, ha we haven't tried the right side, right? No, that, but that's not what happens. I, and I even love this conversation where Jesus is out on the shoreline. Hey, kids, you haven't caught anything yet, it looks like. Huh? <laughs> right? And they've been fishing all night. And their response to this guy out on the shoreline is like, who's this guy? Who's this guy with the questions? That's, that's how I imagine it in my head. And they said to him, no, thanks for, thanks for noticing that. We have it. Hear my voice. I love the beauty of this moment. Hear my voice. Cast on the right side of the boat. So they cast, therefore. And here's what we're told. They cast and they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. They couldn't even haul it in. It was more work than seven disciples, seven good men could do together. And the beauty as well, when you look at that picture, is like, get more then! Get more people. Get them fishing. Tell people that fish are being caught. And why? Because now that Jesus' presence has shown up and he's given direction to his children, to his disciples to say, cast in this way, in this manner, in this direction. I know one word that the Lord has been continuously giving us in our church since I arrived here, and these weren't my words. It was, invite your friends. And your enemies. Amen. Invite them all. Invite them all. Have your eyes open to what Jesus is putting on your life. And saying, I want you to minister to this one. I want you to reach out to this one. And I love what God does sometimes. Because he causes us 
oh man, he's speaking to me right now. He causes us to look at the people who we would say, that one isn't reachable. My wine won't cast that far. I almost got Cindy, right? Cindy's okay, that wasn't an illustration of somebody better go catch Cindy, okay? My line doesn't cast that far. My love is limited. Lord, so as you're, as you're talking with me and declaring to me and saying, drop the net on the left side of the boat or cast in this direction, can we have the faith and the trust that as he's speaking to us and he says, invite this one, that we respond to it in faith and that we drop the net and see if that fish might be caught. And as one fish is caught, one fish says, whoa, there was something over here. There's something over here. And another fish is caught. And another fish is caught. And that all begins even with just one person saying, let's go fishing. And then another person hearing that invitation. You're going fishing? I'd love to go fishing too. I mean, can we give new meaning to the bumper stickers that are out there? I'd rather be fishing. <laughs> what do you mean by that? What I mean is I would rather be fishing for men and doing the work, the kingdom work that God would call me to and us to, brothers and sisters, to be Christ followers, to be Christians, and to reach out to the world in whatever way the Lord is calling us to do. And that we would even wait for him in the night. That we would continue to cast and continue to cast. Believing that at some point with all the work that's being done, something will come in. Didn't we talk about that? Getting into the ditches. Going into the ditches. Ditches. Do you, do you think that the disciples enjoyed fishing all night and catching nothing? No. They hated it. They wanted stories to tell of the three foot you know, salmons and whatever fish, you know, that we, that we talk about, we, they wanted a good catch. They wanted a good catch. And the allegory and the connection in this is, uh, are we willing to fish in the night? Are we willing to fish in the night? Okay? Does it feel like nighttime right now where we live? I mean, our... Our, the world around us is a bit of a wreck. It looks dark. It looks like there can't be any fish to be caught. But I'm telling you, keep fishing. Keep dropping. Keep dropping because daybreak will come. And it comes when Jesus is present. The light of the world, the light of our life to be led by him and to keep fishing. Because I'll tell you, what if the disciples weren't in the boat? What if they just said, for two hours, we gave it a shot, we didn't catch anything, let's just go in. Let's give it up. Not today. But they kept fishing. And so when Jesus showed up, they were still stripped, they were still working, they were still ready to take in the hall. And Jesus said, now drop the net. Are you getting it? We are called to be fishers of men, to fish in the night even, to fish when it seems like there could never be any catch at all, so that we can always be ready that when Jesus calls out to us and says, drop the net also now in this way, that we would, and we would catch a haul even larger than what we're able to take in. Let's read the, the final verses here to close this out. Verse 8. The other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards away, dragging the net full of fish. And so when they got out upon the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up 
and drew the net to land, to land, full of, not small fish, like that little note in there, large fish. They, they, it's the Holy Spirit led them to write this. You go ahead and annotate that they were large fish. Because we'd like to catch large fish. A hundred and fifty-three of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. It could be used again. One of our carrying themes in the Lord's church here is being an eternity-focused people. And I'm not sure if you caught it in these final verses, but I'll tell you, in the allegories of things, this is a picture of heaven. The disciples have come out off of the waters. They finished the work. The Lord said, drop the net, grab that catch, and they grabbed that catch. And when they knew who he was, they said, let's go running. Oh, we know who that is. And they brought with them the catch of fish. They brought with them the catch of fish. Church, we are called to be in the business of fishing and fishing for men. The Lord, I can only imagine the joy and the excitement on his face and on his disciples' face as they had this marvelous and incredible and miraculous catch of fish because the Lord was in the work. And they drew it up. And in my mind's imagination, they laid it before the Lord. And they said, here's the catch, Lord. Because of you. Because of you. And as we are fishing for men, as we're doing that work, as we're fishing in that night, we hear the call and we strip ourselves and we get into the work. The question is, how many fish does the Lord mean for us to catch? His disciples caught 153 in a day's work. In church, we may think we have a lot of time to fish, but the truth of the matter is that we have very little time to fish. In the perspective of all that eternity is, we only get so much to drop the lures in the water and ask the Lord, where would you have me cast? In what direction? Who do you have me to catch that you've put near the boat, near my life, near the work that you've called me to do? The Lord has called us to fish. And I know some of you are hearing this morning from the Lord. You're hearing him say, go fishing. Go fishing. See what you might catch in my name and in my power. And we will get to rejoice on the shoreline of heaven. Even as the disciples rejoiced on the shorelines with Jesus at the catch we were able to catch because of him and because we chose to participate in his work. <clears throat> Lord, there's a number of us in here today that don't feel equipped to be fishermen. We can be so misguided and thinking if we get the right words and do the right things, uh, that at some point we're going to start catching fish. We thank you so much for your scripture and for your word, which reminds us today that no matter how ill-equipped we are or think we are, Lord, we are already equipped with all that we need because we have your Holy Spirit living in us to guide us in our lives. And Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. 
And if we would call on you every morning, if we would call on you in saying, Lord, speak that I may hear, we know that your words back to us will be, come and follow me. So Lord, let all that we do be all that you are leading us to do. There may be some of us in here today where we've been hearing from you, cast on this side of the boat, but we want to say to you, but Lord, but Lord, let us say yes to you now. Let us say yes to the work you've called us into. And we just want you to have all the honor and glory and praise, Jesus. God, this is your church and your people. And we know that you mean for us to go out and fish and to bring others in to, to know you. Let the day break. Let the day break in Jesus' name. And let us be about that work, fishing for you. Amen.